You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Does the human body contain inexplicable mysteries beyond the reach of medical science? In Arkansas, a skydiver plummets to the earth from over 11,000 feet and somehow survives. How? In New York, a man is vaporized as he lies in bed. Can humans spontaneously combust? I've been to fires before, too, and it never anything, nothing like that. And in England, a young girl becomes supercharged with electricity. Is she a walking power grid? She wouldn't touch me if she was switching the light switch on because a jolt of electricity would go through her. Yeah. It's a weird world, and I love it. The human body. Remarkable, isn't it? Well, this one is anyway. Just a candid shot of me at the beach. But this is what we all look like underneath. Unless you believe in reincarnation, we only get one of these. But do we really appreciate just how incredible these things that carry us around are, or do we take them for granted? You see, many believe we're much more than just skin and bones. That there's things going on inside us that modern medicine may never be able to explain. Is it true? Do you think they can help me with my indigestion? October 9th, 2005. Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Hi, what's your name? Do you know my name? Adrenaline junkie Shayna Richardson, 21, is about to attempt her first solo skydive. <laughs> All right, Shayna. Shayna's husband, Rick West, was also her jump instructor. I was very confident that, you know, that she was well prepared for this. Rick has a helmet camera Hi, Shana. <laughs> to capture Shayna's jump. Together, they will free fall from an altitude of 11,000 feet, more than two miles high. At first, things go great. We exited the plane well and she did a perfect dive. Rick and Shayna are plummeting to Earth at terminal velocity, 120 miles per hour. After 30 seconds of free fall, Shayna pulls the ripcord. And as you see in the video, I say, Woo! Good job, Shayna. And I had no idea at this time that she was in any kind of trouble until I look up. What Rick sees fills him with horror. On her very first jump, his wife's main parachute has failed. Desperate, Shayna releases it and tries her reserve. And then her reserve didn't work out so well. Unable to help, Rick realizes he is watching what will be his wife's final moments. Shayna is spinning out of control. Shayna! 8,000 feet from the ground, Shayna's reserve parachute is tangled. She is now plummeting uncontrollably towards the ground at over 70 feet per second. Panic sets in. Shayna! 
she kept spinning and kept spinning and spinning. And the closer and closer we get, I'm seeing cars, semis, the road, buildings. She was heading right into. Helpless, Rick can only watch as Shayna spins towards certain death. It was horrible for me. It was just a sickening feeling. To Rick's horror, Shayna slams directly into a parking lot. I was sure she was dead or going to be dead really quick. And as soon as I landed, I turned the camera off, and I was just trying to get to her in time to tell her that I love her, and I'm sorry. She was actually laying in a pool of blood. Her bottom lip had been busted, peeled out, uh, split above her nose, was wide open. You could almost see the bone. But something miraculous has happened. I really did firmly believe that I was going to die. Despite smashing into asphalt from a height of two miles, Shayna is somehow alive. My face hit a split second before the rest of my body did. The doctors described my facial fractures as kind of an eggshell effect. I broke pretty much every bone in my face, my ocular sockets, my sinus cavity. I knocked out the front five teeth in my mouth, so they had to completely rebuild my face. I broke my pelvis in three places. I broke my right leg. Shayna's doctors can't comprehend how she survived her fall, but then their jaws drop even lower. Shayna's not the only survivor. The very first thing I remember hearing from the doctors was about the baby. Unknown to both Shayna and Rick, she's pregnant. Miraculously, both mother and baby survive. Their son, Tanner, is now five. Somehow, this remarkable story has a happy ending, but the doctors are still trying to figure it out. The doctors in that hospital just said, this is, a, this is amazing, this is a miracle. I don't understand. So how are Shayna and her unborn child able to survive such an unbelievable fall? What had happened that saved their lives? Dr. Chris Hart is an expert in aviation accident investigation. He's extensively studied Shayna's accident and has reached a controversial conclusion. I think the way she hit the ground is, is critically important for why she survived. It's believed that Shayna face planted into the ground. But Hart disagrees. Looking at the video, I don't believe she hit the ground face first. Clearly, she's at about a 45 to 60 degree angle. So when she finally makes contact with the ground, she contacts feet first, then legs, then side, and then finally head. The, the injuries to her pelvis and to her legs are, are very common when someone lands feet first. If it's a head first injury, you typically don't see those types of injuries. Hart believes that the angle of Shayna's fall was critical to her survival, as it enabled her to inadvertently perform a skydiving safety technique. I think just the laws of physics dictated that the way her body hit was very similar to a parachute landing fall. The parachute landing fall is a technique for improving the odds of surviving a hard landing without injury. The technique is essentially to distribute the force of impact over five body points. You start with contacting on the balls of the feet, and then the calves, then the thighs, then the hips, and then the side of the back. You can think of the parachute landing fall as almost being like a bumper on a car. The head is what you want to protect. The body acts as the shock absorber. But what about the damage to Shayna's face? How could a successful parachute landing fall have resulted in such horrific injuries? Even though she didn't hit face first, her body was traveling at a very high rate of speed. She sustained injuries to every part of her body that hit the ground. Her face was probably the last thing that hit the ground, but it was still moving fast enough to cause some pretty serious injuries. Given her lack of training, it's very fortunate that Shayna executed what was very similar to a parachute landing fall. Had she not done that, she almost certainly would have perished. She should consider herself very fortunate. Did the accidental execution of the parachute landing fall save Shayna's life? Or is the explanation beyond the understanding of science? She was exempt from the laws of gravity. 
21-year-old Shayna Richardson experiences every skydiver's nightmare. When her parachutes fail, she slams into the ground from 11,000 feet. But amazingly, Shayna survives. How? Sophie Burnham is an author. She believes Shayna's survival was, quite literally, a miracle. To me, her survival is incomprehensible, except by divine intervention. It had to be the hand of an angel. She was exempt from the laws of gravity. We've all heard of angels, but let's just make sure we're on the same page as Sophie. The angels are messengers of the divine, and they can come in any form. They come to the innocent, to people whose work is not yet finished on this plane of existence. Angels save people from possible death in any way that it can be done. Sometimes it's by deflecting a bullet, and sometimes it's by preventing a car accident. They can change all the physical laws of the universe. No doubt they do good work, but how exactly did an angel save Shana? It is not difficult for me to believe that an angel carried Shana down or broke her fall so that she would not fall as swiftly as she should have. It's an interesting theory, but is it supported by scientific proof? Lots of times, miracles occur with scientific explanations and are just as miraculous. I don't think that science and miracles are mutually exclusive. And I think that there is a spiritual dimension that we live in as fish live in water. I am sure that some people completely dismiss the idea that an angel could save Shana's life. And I think it's very important for some people to believe that they are in control. We don't want to be so completely at the mercy of fate and fortune that there's nothing that we can do. I would not try to dissuade somebody from that position if it's important to him. But to me, I would need very, very strong proof of something that happened. <laughs> like she pulled a third para parachute out and came down. I would need very strong scientific proof. I can't imagine what would have happened if an angel had not saved Shana that day, there would have been her body splattered over the parking lot in a gory, bloody, disgusting, horrible, horrible accident. It would have been ghastly. Wow, this is incredible. Instead of being splattered all over the parking lot, Sophie thinks an angel swooped down at the last moment somehow taking hold of Shayna, breaking her fall. Could this really be possible? Regardless of your beliefs, one has to admit that Shayna's story is, well, miraculous. But could a guardian angel have slowed Shayna's fall, sparing her life the life of her unborn son? And if so, don't they deserve some thanks? There is no evidence that guardian angels exist. There is no empirical evidence for it. Okay, it's just, it's just people trying to put meaning onto things they don't understand. You know, this is the 21st century, for goodness sake. We need to move on. John Leach is a survival psychologist with the Norwegian Armed Forces. He believes the key to shame of survival lies in a theory that's far more down to earth. If a person is falling without a parachute, after about 12 seconds, they'll reach the maximum rate of descent. And it doesn't matter how long they're falling for, they will stay at 120 miles an hour. If Shayna had hit the ground at normal terminal velocity of 120 miles an hour, she would have had a very small chance of surviving that, especially on the, on the sort of ground that she hit. Now, there are cases of people who have survived from terminal velocity, but usually uh, it's because they've gone into soft ground, they've gone into mud, they've gone into snow, they've gone into trees. So there's something that's actually decelerated their, their speed at the last minute. 
But if her chances of surviving were so low, how is it that Shayna and Tanner are still with us? You can see from the, uh, the video that although the parachute was uh, malfunctioning, it wasn't completely dysfunctional. In other words, it was still acting as a sort of parachute and providing a degree of drag. So instead of hitting the ground at 120 miles an hour, which is a terminal velocity for somebody traveling without a parachute, uh, she hit the ground at 50 miles an hour, according to the records. Was Shayna's survival connected to how fast she hit the ground? Or did something else save her? Age plays a role in survival for various reasons. And a number of studies involving uh, analysis of, for example, road traffic accidents at different speeds shows that one of the best ages for surviving an impact at 50 miles an hour is Shana's age, so somewhere between the uh, late teens and early 20s. For Leach, the final factor in Shana's survival is the angle of impact, though with a very different take to Dr. Chris Hart. I don't think you should be uh, deploying any parachute landing technique. The parachute was moving her into a more horizontal position, and the injuries that she sustained is consistent with that type of impact on the ground. And the fact that she hit the ground more or less horizontally rather than on her head or through her feet uh, also increased the chances of survival. For Leach, the combination of a partially effective parachute, Shana's age, and landing almost flat to the ground is enough to leave her battered but still breathing. All these factors together all contribute to her chances of surviving. So there's nothing miraculous about it. It's straightforward physics. I did jump one more time. When Tanner was six weeks old, I went and jumped again. I did a tandem jump. I landed, took my gear off, grabbed my son, and I haven't been back up. I, I love the sport. I love the thrill of it. But my kids give me a much greater thrill, and I, I don't have it in me anymore. I can't do it. Can Shayna's remarkable survival be explained by physics? Or did divine intervention play a part? Was she saved by a higher power? Or did she just get lucky and deploy the parachute landing fall? For now, it will remain a head scratcher that's most definitely weird, or oh, what? In upstate New York, a man is incinerated in his own bed. With no plausible explanation, investigators are left with a terrifying question. Can we spontaneously combust? When someone is cremated, there's probably more remains after that cremation than there was at this incident. You know, a fire is a wonderful thing. We've harnessed its power in so many ways we'd be lost without it. It does everything keeping us warm to one of my favorites, cooking up a storm. <laughs> well, that's, uh, if you can get it started, of course. The thing about fire is that, uh, uh, as well as being our friend, it can be our worst enemy. Does anyone smell anything that, uh, In 1986, college student Ray Harlan was visiting his father, Jack, a coroner in New York State, when the phone rang. It would lead them on the most mysterious and bizarre journey of their lives. My dad owns a local funeral home, and he was also the county coroner. They just said that there was an unattended death, and one of us always went with them to help them with removals. The deceased is a 58-year-old retired fireman, George Mott. When Ray and Jack arrive at Mott's house, everything seems normal. It was just a typical home in the back roads of the Adirondacks. But nothing has prepared the Harlands for what they find inside. The first words out of the state trooper's mouth to my dad was, uh, I don't think you're going to need your stretcher for this one. Entering the house, Ray and Jack notice something that tells them this is no ordinary death. There was a thin black film covering everything. It was like a dust powder. 
It was strange because it looked like there was a fire, but there was nothing really charred. Where is George Mott? As they move deeper into the house, they're about to make a shocking discovery. When we walked into the bedroom, you could see where Mr. Mott was laying. In my lifetime growing up in the funeral home, I've probably seen over a 1,000 bodies in various conditions. And I've been to fires before, too, and there's never anything, nothing like that. It was a perfect outline of his body burned into the mattress. And the only thing that was left of him was his head, a few ribs, and his right foot. Everything else was gone. What happened to George Mott? The charred remains suggest he died in a fire, but this was no ordinary blaze. Using the fire instead, the whole body remains. You never see parts of the body missing. To put it in perspective, when someone is cremated for five to six, sometimes seven hours, there's, there's probably more remains after that cremation than there was at this incident. It's a baffling and gruesome mystery. George Mott has been incinerated to a fine powder, but somehow the objects around him are not even singed, including a canister of matches only inches away. But how? Remarkably, all over Mott's house, there is evidence that this was a fire unlike any other. Everything plastic was melted. The casing on the TV was distorted, and the telephone was melted to a ball plastic. It's an incredible puzzle. What sort of heat or fire could vaporize a man and melt plastic but not burn the house down? The fireman thought it was a gas leak underneath his bed. But if it was a gas leak and it was fire, there would have been a lot more burning. They'd never found a gas leak. It's left to Ray to offer a theory. I mentioned human spontaneous combustion, and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. Spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, is a bizarre and weird phenomenon in which a person instantly bursts into flames for no apparent reason. Amazingly, there have been 40 other cases of SHC documented in the last century. To that point, I don't think anybody in that room has heard of it. And everybody almost had the same reaction. What a spontaneous combustion, what is that? The investigation into George Mott's death failed to reach a conclusion, but Ray Harlan has no doubt what happened. I still believe that it was spontaneous combustion because there is, there is no other explanation. This is what I saw. Now, this is weird or what? I mean, we know heavy metal rock drummers spontaneously combust all the time, but an innocent, harmless man minding his own business in bed and then Puff, he goes up in smoke. I mean, what's going on here? Are any of us safe? Oh, no, not again. Was George Mott a victim of SHC? Can a human simply ignite and burn without any external cause? Spontaneous human combustion is amazing, bizarre, horrific, given all that. It still happens. A man is incinerated by a bizarre, inexplicable fire. Is his death proof that people can just spontaneously catch fire? We have spent more than three decades looking at this incredibly weird phenomenon, and our conclusion is absolutely categorically, yes, it does happen. Larry Arnold is a writer. He's dedicated himself to the study of SHC. He came to the scene of the George Mott conflagration. To be at the scene of one of these remarkably rare and phenomenal events is eerie. It's unearthly. We look at the person who used to be there, and we're looking at something burned more completely than after several hours at several thousand degrees Fahrenheit. The George Mott fire scene is incredibly complex and very puzzling, even to someone such as ourself who has looked at scores of cases that seem to emulate the kind of fire that consumed Mr. Mott. Something burned up Mr. Mott more completely than can be accomplished in a crematorium. His body burned through his bed, actually pushed the mattress springs into a V, burned through the boarding underneath the mattress, burned through the floorboards, 
and into a crawl space below. There is no heat or flame damage directly above the point of combustion that consumed Mr. Mott. We could touch the ceiling. It was about seven and a half feet high. Not a scorch mark of any kind on the ceiling directly above the point of combustion. In most fires, heat rises. We would expect to see a lot of heat and flame damage above the bed. Zero. Throughout the house, there was a nonsensical pattern of melted plastics or not melted plastics. Um, it, it's baffling to us to this day, and we spent a lot of hours, as did the county officials, investigating this fire scene. But if Mott self-immolated, how did it happen? Arnold believes the answer can be found in something so tiny, we can't even see it. We wondered how much energy it takes to cremate someone like George Mott in the natural conditions, and if there could be a particle that would have that amount of energy contained within it. So we pulled up a theory from quantum physics, crunched the numbers. You come up with a particle that is incredibly small, much smaller than an atom, but it has an energy level of which is humongous. Arnold calls these subatomic particles pyrotrons. He believes they may be tiny, but they pack a punch. It's so small that it can pass through three-dimensional matter almost unimpeded, perhaps through galaxies without ever striking something. But according to Arnold, when the pyrotron does connect with something physical, the results are catastrophic. But on rare occasion, what runs out, happenstance happens, and in those conditions when the pyrotron with it, its incredibly high energy impacts something that's inside a human being, we posit the end result is spontaneous human combustion. In essence, a, a human Hiroshima effect, a thermonuclear explosion, if you will, in the body. Is spontaneous human combustion the result of a pyrotron colliding with a particle inside the human body? Did George Mott die from a freak collision of physics? There simply is no plausible way uh, by any chemical mechanism known that the body could just suddenly burst into flames and proceed to be destroyed. Joe Nickel is an investigator of the paranormal and a firm believer that spontaneous human combustion is a myth with a rational explanation. I looked at 30 historical cases from the 18th century throughout the 20th century. And in every case, I could find a plausible source for the ignition. For example, uh, the famous case in America of Mary Reeser in 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida, she burned up in a, in a very unusual way, sort of one of the classic cases. But when she was last seen, and this is left out of some of the, the stories, she was wearing flammable night clothes, sitting in a big stuffed chair, smoking a cigarette, having taken two second all sleeping tablets and planned to take two more sleeping tablets before going to bed because she was having trouble sleeping. Now, it's kind of a no-brainer to suggest that she caught on fire by dozing off and dropping her cigarette. Yes, yes, there are other mysteries. Why did her body burn so thoroughly and why were nearby objects? We take those one at a time. And in these cases, you can't just have a sort of simple-minded, one-size-fits-all explanation and say, oh yeah, that's just this. No, you have to actually look at the, the facts in a particular case and look at the physics, because there are no two quite alike. The most logical explanation for the George Mott fire was a canister of matches sitting on, of all places, his oxygen enricher unit. He had either been somewhere to light a stove uh, or something, and a spark could have gotten onto his clothes. But how could a spark or a cigarette burn a human body to the extent seen in SHC cases? In the forensic literature is something known as the wick effect. And that is, if you think of a wick in a candle, the wick is not doing much burning. The wick is simply a conduit. Now, if you think of the human body as sort of a candle inside out, the body has a lot of fat. It's very flammable. Sounds horrific. How can someone become a human candle? 
The clothing acts as a kind of wick in which once the body begins to burn, that body fat can be absorbed by clothing, mattress, and that begins this cyclical process in which the body burns, releasing more body fat to destroy still more of the body to release more. It's the wick effect that's helping this burn in a very efficient way. There's never a big fire when the body burns in this way. It's not a huge inferno. The results afterwards may look like that's what happened. But what actually happened is just that the body burned very slowly and very efficiently where the body fat was, in the torso, the upper thighs. You'll often find limbs or body parts that are not burned for pretty obvious reasons. They're not, they don't have as much body fat. Even a lean person has a significant amount of body fat. So this, while this isn't an explanation for all burning deaths, it's a relevant factor in some of the unusual cases because it can explain why over a period of several hours, a fire is progressing and attacking and burning a body which is actually supplying the fuel for its own destruction. But if your clothes catch fire, you simply put them out, right? In some cases, the person may have had a seizure or a heart attack. In other cases, they may have been lying asleep and smoldering material near them first started burning, creating a lot of smoke. They may have died of smoke inhalation and never woken up. Nickel believes that his theory can explain the almost complete lack of fire damage around the body. Since there's never a big fire here, nearby objects are not gonna be burned. Just as you can sit just inches away from a campfire and toast a marshmallow and not be burned, the same is true with this wick effect. But does this explain the other objects that were melted throughout George's house? The heat, of course, is gathering and rising. Objects above a certain line will be melted because the heat is accumulated there. And in the Mott case, there was soot all over. There's usually a sooty deposit if there's a lot of organic material being burned. For Nickel, the answer is clear. If science knows anything about spontaneous human combustion, it is that it doesn't exist. It's difficult to prove a negative, but we don't have to. There just is no evidence. It is to say it's unlikely does not do justice to how very, very, very far-fetched this idea is. The George Mott case was a mystery. I would consider it basically a mystery solved. Does Nichols' theory prove that SHC does not exist? Can these horrific deaths be explained by the Wick effect? We've tried to conduct those experiments ourselves. We know others in the forensics field who have done so. They can't replicate these fire scenes under controlled scientific conditions. It doesn't work for us, and it did not work for the local investigators in Essex County. This is an example of individuals making up facts, creating stories, generating hypotheses without foundation to explain away something that they don't otherwise want to confront. Spontaneous human combustion is amazing, bizarre, horrific. Given all that, it still happens. So is spontaneous human combustion real? It's a debate that will continue to rage. One thing we do know for certain, though, it's definitely weird. Or what? British woman reports an ability that defies science. Can she harness electrical power? The possibilities of things going wrong are just mind-blowingly frightening. You know, when it comes to medicine, there's very little modern science can't explain. Oh, my God! What is that disgusting thing in there? Oh. Sometimes we come across things that are not only inexplicable, they send a shiver down your spine. Or in the case of our next story, a million volts through your hand. Whoa, weird. Oh, or what? Growing up in London, England, Debbie Wolf thought she was a normal child. I think when you're a small child, you don't realize you're different from anyone else. 
But my mum got it pretty quickly, I think. Shortly after Debbie turned four, her mother noticed there was something rather unusual about her daughter. My mum noticed, like, hot spots of problems. It was just the era of um, everyone had Walkmans and I drained the batteries and light bulbs seemed to be quite vulnerable. My mum wouldn't touch me if she was switching the light switch on because a jolt of electricity would go through her. Incredibly, it seems this tiny girl had somehow become supercharged with electricity. But what could cause this weird phenomenon? For Debbie and her family, it's just the start of a bizarre and literally shocking ordeal. Every time I walked past the telly, the channels would start changing. The volume would go up or down, and it would switch off. I was always excluded from the lounge when the football was on because my dad didn't want me changing the channels. Incredibly, when Debbie interacts with anything electrical, havoc ensues. She fries appliances, drains batteries, and explodes light bulbs. And as she gets older, the condition gets worse. There's one particular occasion that I remember. Um, I can't have been more than about six. Uh, we went to this shop, one of my mum's favourite shops, and as we went past each streetlight, it went off and on and off and on as we passed them. Remarkably, Debbie's electrical power grows with every step. By the time they arrive at the shop, things are getting out of control. They had these metal rails where the clothes were displayed, and for some reason that seemed to spark me. So much so that I could touch it and you'd see sparks and you'd hear the crack of the spark. So my mum tried to herd me away from that. But her mum doesn't act fast enough. Debbie's touch electrifies the entire store, blowing the fuses and plunging it into complete darkness. Terrified of her young child's weird power, Debbie's mum rushes her from the shop. My mum made rules about what I was allowed to do and not allowed to do because um, it was disruptive. What happened to Debbie Wolf? Could she be cured by medicine? Or did she need an electrician? Sadly, her condition hasn't gone away. Over three decades later, she is still suffering. I affected everything. I lost a job in a nightclub because every time I walked past the DJ box, the music would go off. My house is just like a graveyard of electrical goods. And I've usually got a TV or something sitting in my drive waiting to be taken to the dump. I get through an extraordinary amount of kettles and toasters and TVs. So I tend to buy second-hand TVs. Um, and it is expensive and inconvenient, and I'm not always welcome in people's houses. I don't know from day to day what's going to work and what isn't, which is quite annoying when the fridge is defrosting um, in the morning. So uh, basically, my house is just, you know, on a short lifespan. The thing I hate most to do, but I have to do it anyway, is flying. I just hate flying. The fear of being able to stop a plane in midair, having it drop out of the sky. No, 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 because the possibilities of things going wrong are just mind-blowingly frightening. Is Debbie somehow generating lethal amounts of electricity? If so, how and why? Incredibly, she isn't the only one suffering from this bizarre affliction. Thousands of others have it too, and it's even been given a name. Street light interference syndrome. Those who have it are called sliders. What are sliders and where do they get their supercharged powers? Are they a threat to themselves or even us? Bill Beatty is an electrical engineer. He thinks he can explain sliders. I um, first heard about this um, in the 80s and I started wondering, are they some kind of um, electric generator? Could sliders like Debbie actually be generating their own electricity? How could she do it? 
Beatty thinks her power could be an extension of something we've all experienced. So if you scuff on the rug and touch a doorknob and you hear that little click, that's static electricity. The effect is caused by your body being charged. Rubbing your feet steals negatively charged electrons from the carpet. With each step, you steal more electrons and develop more of a negative charge, something easily detected with a voltmeter. If I scuff on the rug, watch what happens. I'm scuffing my shoe, oh, and they're all, they're all turning on and off. This, this is me moving my shoe up and down on the, on the carpet. There's some more over there. So a science fair project for kids, a little transistor voltage detector. So if you were an electric human, I, um, you wouldn't have to scuff on the carpet. So if I could um, stand perfectly still and wait for long enough for my charge to go away, oh, it's gone again. So it already leaked away here. Um, I would be turning the light on and off if my body charged up by itself. So I'm not an electric human, oh well. But could this build up enough charge to affect a street light? Beatty believes sliders could generate large amounts of static electricity in another way. Well, there's one thing that um, humans do which might explain this, and that's um, breathing. Every day, humans take over 25,000 breaths. Remarkably, Beatty thinks it's possible we can steal a few electrons from the air each time we breathe in and eventually supercharge our bodies. If you can charge your body up by breathing, you have this field, invisible field of voltage around your body that can affect electronic devices, even from a few feet away. But if everyone breathes air, why would only a few people, like Debbie, turn into human lightning bugs? There's a chance of that it could be a virus that hasn't been discovered yet. There are a few viruses that they're not like the flu or colds. Instead, when you catch it, there's almost um, no change, and then your, your body easily fights it off. Um, if it's um, communicable, then you'd think that there'd be lots of electric humans, or you'd get it for a while, and then it would be gone again. But this sounds more like it might be something that's um, a, like a symbiotic thing, that maybe you're born with it, and you can't give it to other people. Could some yet-to-be-discovered virus alter the lungs of sliders just enough to strip electrons from the air and turn them into supercharged humans? Or is Beatty's theory a few connections short of a circuit? Oh, I was attracted to it because it's weird, but the vast, unstudied collection of weird things, some of those are real, and those are Nobel Prize discoveries. So let me get this right. Sliders have an innate ability to wreak havoc on electrical goods, especially uh, street lights, right? And one guy thinks the reason they can do this is there's a virus going around that can supercharge your body as you breathe. <sighs> Nothing. <sighs> Can't we come up with a better explanation? I mean, when it comes to electrical faults, isn't it just a matter of some dummy doing something Stupid. So do sliders really have the power to generate electricity? The phenomenon, to me, is not a real phenomenon at all. Around the world, hundreds of people known as sliders claim to have the ability to interfere with electricity. Do they have a science-baffling superpower? Lee Colville has studied sliders for five years. He thinks he's found another way to explain the phenomenon. It's hardly improbable that anyone could generate enough electricity to, to affect a street lamp. You know, we're talking about millions of volts here, as, as with a lightning bolt, and obviously a, a very high current flow. I mean, basically, if anyone could generate that amount of electricity, they, I mean, they, they would kill them. You know, the current flow them, it itself would kill them and probably fry them, and they'd be blowing cars up and all sorts all over the place. You know, you don't see that, so, so therefore, it's very unlikely. The most plausible explanation to me is basically pure coincidence. But how could pure chance explain the incredible effect sliders have over electrical devices like street lamps? Most people are not aware of how the street light works or what happens when the street light malfunctions. Here we have a 
common example of a street lamp, which is a high pressure sodium lamp. Many street lights use powerful sodium light bulbs. When they get old, they don't just burn out or even flicker like fluorescent bulbs. Instead, they begin a process called cycling. It will turn off. When it cools down, it will basically come on again. Obviously, it will get too hot, then it will cool down again, come back on again, cycling on and off periodically. If someone walked under a cycling street lamp at just the right moment, they could think they turned it off. But what about Debbie Wolf? She made a whole street go haywire. A row of lamps that's probably installed at the same time. So the chances are that if one is faulty, you're going to find another one that's faulty on, along the same row. Do faulty street lights explain this mystery? What about all the other electrical gadgets that sliders like Deborah destroy? Static electricity, it's as it's mundane as that. If you've got someone with very dry skin, you could build up quite a large voltage. And by touching any electrical appliance, it could discharge and cause damage to um, sensitive components. Are sliders just mistaking static electricity and coincidence for superpowers? There's no reason to be frightened of spending time around a ledge slider because the phenomena, it, to me, is not a real phenomena at all. So, is this the end of the mystery? Maybe not. Suan Jaising is a mechanical engineer who was intrigued by Debbie's story. A person being able to produce energy or harness energy is much like the X-Men, so it kind of provoked my interest. He's come up with a remarkable new theory to explain what is happening. I'm a bit skeptical that the body alone can generate enough energy to knock off electrical uh, street lights, but Debbie's body could absorb energy uh, from around us and release it in, from, in the form of an electrical pulse. Instead of creating electrical energy, could Debbie actually be sucking it up from the world around her? Electricity plays uh, quite an important role in our human body. Theoretically, one could uh, possess the ability to store electricity through their bodies, just like a capacitor. Capacitors are common in all electronics. They are used to gradually soak up excess electricity and then discharge it in a flash. Could Debbie be a human capacitor? Her body may possess uh, molecules that are able to harness this power. To prove his theory, J. Singh has conducted tests designed to try and stimulate Debbie into releasing an electrical charge. Using an oscilloscope, an instrument which measures voltage, he compares her output to someone with a normal charge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, show you some images, see whether we are able to uh, simulate some electricity, OK? Debbie seems to become most electric when she's excited or stressed. Jason uses images he hopes will recreate those feelings. Although not conclusive, some of Jason's experiments have produced surprising results. With Debbie, we noticed that there was a voltage that was being measured from her body uh, that was different to what could be measured from ours. So the slider phenomenon does exist. But this phenomenon isn't something Debbie can turn on and off at will. It's very hard to bring myself to a place where I'm going to be electric, I suppose. I mean, I'd be a much richer person if I could do circus tricks, and I can't. It just happens. Are Debbie and thousands like her really able to store electricity and release it in a flash? Could a rare virus have turned them into human generators? Or could it all be just a series of shocking coincidences? Whatever the answer, it's most definitely weird. But what? So there we have it. Three bizarre medical mysteries. An Arkansas woman baffles medical professionals by surviving a horrific skydiving accident. 
In upstate New York, a man vaporized in a fire leaves investigators asking, can humans spontaneously combust? And a group of people report being able to interfere with electricity. Do they have an inexplicable superpower? You decide. Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what? You know, I've been around for a while. I've met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. You'd think that there wasn't much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer and others just defy logic. Can we cheat death? On 9-11, a man survives the horrific collapse of the North Tower. How? I thought, this is how I'm gonna die. Did a miraculous cushion of air keep him alive? In Texas, a man is cut in two of freak accident. Somehow, he lives. I didn't know if I had my legs, I didn't know if I didn't have my legs. Was he saved by the very machine that almost killed him? And in Zimbabwe, a tour guide is attacked by one of the world's deadliest animals. I remember wondering which would happen first, if I'd bleed to death or if I'm drowned. He lives through the ultimate fight to the death. How? Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. things to each other they always have the history of mankind is littered with horrific events that have taken the lives of millions and all for what september the 11th 2001 will go down as one of our very darkest days the day that true terror came to america do you remember what you were doing like millions of others i was watching the whole thing on tv dumbfounded and awestruck at the sheer violence of it all as the towers came down 110 stories of steel and concrete reduced to rubble in a matter of seconds. My first thought was no one could survive inside that apocalypse. I was wrong. New York City, September the 11th, 2001. At 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 hits the North Tower of the World Trade Center. In the chaotic minutes after the crash, many inside the building are unaware of what just happened. In his North Tower office, structural engineer Pasquale Bozzelli is on the phone to his wife, trying to get information. Don't be alarmed. Just turn on the television and tell me what you see. Pasquale, she goes, a plane hit your building. Can you tell me, did it hit low on the building? Did it hit in the middle of the building, or did it hit high? She said it's like it hit pretty high in the building. His office is on the 64th floor, 30 floors below the impact zone. But Pasquale's relief doesn't last long. Minutes later, a second plane crashes into the South Tower. When the second plane hit, you know, just like everyone else, it wasn't just an accident. It's a terrorist attack. And then smoke actually started entering the floor. What should we do? Pasquale gathers his colleagues to evacuate. We went out into the hallway and entered the stairway and looked in, and it was clear. With time running out, the group have no idea what they'll find there. They make slow but steady progress down seemingly endless flights of stairs. Suddenly, 
the building shudders violently. It's the massive shockwave caused by the collapse of the South Tower. The tremors leave Pasquale and his colleagues terrified. If they're going to survive, they have to move faster. We could take an elevator on the 24th floor if we wanted to get at it a little quicker, but we knew not to get into an elevator at that point, and, and we just kept going on. As they reach the 22nd floor, the squall hears something terrifying and massive. I heard this loud noise from above, like a, like a freight train type of loud, like huge safes tumbling through the stairs. The 110-story North Tower is collapsing above their heads. And they are trapped. There was no place to run. There was no door there. I was halfway down the stairs. I was getting tossed back and forth. Pasquale makes a crucial decision. Instinctively, I just dove right into the corner of the next landing. I curled up in the field position right in the corner. And my thought at the time was, if anything's falling, maybe it would hit the wall rather than hit me. As 500,000 tons of steel and concrete crash down, the squall braces himself. I felt the floor that I was laying on just crack open. The entire building is collapsing. At that split second, I said, oh my god, I can't believe this is how I'm going to die. I prayed for a quick death, and then I was just free falling. In just 25 seconds, the North Tower of the World Trade Center has been reduced to dust. No one inside could survive. But Pasquale Buscelli has defied the odds. One huge flash, and the next thing I know, I opened up my eyes. I thought I was dead. And I started to cough. I started to feel a pain in my leg. That's when I realized I was alive and I felt pain. Sitting on top of a four-story pile of debris, somehow Pasquale Buscelli has survived the collapse and a fall of 55 meters with only a broken foot. And I started to call out help. You know, I was calling out the names of the people that were with me. Is anybody around? Finally, he sees figures moving through the rubble below. I saw two firemen walking, climbing the rubble. And I called out to them. I said, hey, hey, help. I'm up here, I'm up here. The firemen are stunned. They can't believe anyone could be alive this high up in the wreckage. They think Pasquale is another rescue worker. I said, no, I said, it was in the building, it collapsed. And then he got on the, on the radio, goes, we got a civilian, we, have, we, we, have, we found a survivor, we got a survivor. They were just there looking at me, just looking up like, what? How do we get this guy down from there and trying to figure out a way to, to because it was basically, I was hanging off a little ledge uh, and there was just an open pit to them and then more debris field. And then behind me was a mountain of, of rubble and that's it. And there was no way for me to go other than I was between pipe and crushed concrete and, and metal and twisted metal. And I was in, I was sitting on basically just pulverized, almost like a slab, but it was just pulverized concrete. I said, I'm, I said, I'm okay, I need a phone. I need to call my wife. She just watched the thing collapse. So I know she thinks, you know. And um, so I, I, I called my wife. I said, Louise, it's me. It's, she's like, oh my god, Pasquale, it's you, oh my god. I said, I, you know, I just want to let you know I'm OK, and, and, uh, and hopefully I'll be home soon. Almost 3,000 people died on 9-11. Pasquale was one of only 20 survivors found in the rubble. So I fell 18 floors, which is, to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, amazing. I, I still can't believe I survived. How did Pasquale Buscelli live through one of the greatest disasters in history, almost unscathed? Was it just pure luck? Or is there some other explanation? Amazing, isn't it? We all know there are precious few tales of survival from this horrific event, and every one of them is a miracle. But Pasquale Buscelli's story 
seems almost impossible. Not only did he escape the impact and fire, he fell 18 floors and had a half a million tons of debris come down on top of him. And he comes out virtually unscathed. How did he do it? Dr. Kerry Ressler is a behavioral expert at Emory University School of Medicine. He believes the way Pasquale instinctively reacted to fear saved his life. Mr. Buzzelli's story has all the signs of a classic fear reflex. The fear reflex is an instinctive response to life-threatening situations. It originates in a primitive part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is a region in the brain about the size of your thumb. It's inside of the ears, about three or four centimeters in. And it's really one of the most primitive parts of the brain, but one of the most important for survival. And what we know now from literally many decades of research is that the amygdala is really the switch for fear in the mammalian brain, and it's very similar in mice and in humans and apes and everything in between. The amygdala works by telling the rest of the brain what it needs to do to get out of danger. An activation of the amygdala activates a hard-wired reflexive circuit that activates a flight response, a fear response, and really a whole host of immediate survival reflexes that have probably allowed us as a species to survive for hundreds of thousands of years. Dr. Ressler thinks it was this process that caused Pasquale to automatically assume the fetal position as the North Tower came crashing down around him. He was making his way down the stairs. He hears the enormous roar above him. As he's interpreting what's happening, his body has already responded. He's activated this reflexive motor response. He's jumping through the air, curled up in a fetal position. This instinctive reflex action has its roots in a primitive form of defense. Well, I know if I'm going to be attacked or something's falling on me, I need to curl up, protect my vital organs, put my spine out. But it happens too quick for any of those thoughts to occur. This reflexive, primitive brain reaction to survival that kept him alive. Did curling up like an animal help shield Pasquale's body from falling debris? Was he saved by a reflex bred into humans by millions of years of evolution? It's an interesting theory, but a bigger question remains. Why wasn't he crushed by thousands of tons of falling debris? He just hunkered down in the core and prayed. A man survives impossible odds in the collapse of the World Trade Center on 9-11. One expert believes he was saved by an instinctive fear reflex. But 500,000 tons of concrete and steel poured down on top of him. Why wasn't he crushed? Structural engineer Charles Thornton has worked on some of the world's tallest buildings. Thornton is convinced it was the way the Twin Towers were constructed that saved Pasquale's life. The lower part of the tower was supported by 48 massive steel columns that made up the core of the building. But 80% of the weight of the building is carried by these huge sticks, these huge core columns. Thornton thinks when the building collapsed, the columns fell in such a way they acted like a massive steel cage around the stairwell. If you were gonna make it, you would have made it in there because these columns remain straight, which means that they formed a canopy or a teepee over him. And so all of the debris that was coming down, it was sliding outward, going toward the perimeter buildings. But if the columns saved Pasquale's life, why didn't they protect the others? Thornton thinks he has the answer. Pasquale instinctively chose the safest place in the stairwell, the corner. He understood that it was a building that had very, very heavy core columns. He just hunkered down in the core and prayed. While his friends were crushed, Pasquale was shielded by the massive core columns. On 9-11, I came up out of the subway on 23rd and 6th, and the earth was standing still. There were no taxis, there were no people that were moving. Everybody was standing. Men were stoic. Women were crying. Went into our building, which was 20th Street and 6th Avenue. We had the 8th and the 9th floor. Went up on the roof, <laughs> went out, climbed out a window, stood on the roof, and with 20 or 30 structural engineers said, this is really, this is really horrible, but at least they're not gonna fall down. And boom, first one went down, and we just all looked at each other and said, my God, 
that's not supposed to happen. He was in his little cocoon or his little teepee. He's just a very lucky guy. So Pasquale could have been protected from danger from above, but how did he survive a fall of 55 meters with only a broken foot? <laughs> There's so many things involved that allowed this man to survive. J.J. Macro is a Vancouver stunt coordinator. He thinks he knows how Pasquale survived the equivalent of an 18-story fall. Falling is just another form of a crash. J.J.'s convinced the key to surviving any fall is putting on the brakes. Deceleration is the basic principle that we use for saving ourselves when we're doing a fall. It's also the same one that you use in a car crash. Um, what we're trying to do is not stop in one foot when we're going uh, 30 feet to the ground because the G-forces will be what destroy you. So what we try to do is we try to set it up so that gra you, you gradually come to a stop. So what could have slowed down Pasquale enough to save his life? The answer could lie in air trapped in the floors below him. If you watch the footage of the buildings collapsing, you see all this air uh, circulating everywhere. And I think it was actually forming a cushion underneath them as each floor, as it hit each floor, it just kept forming more and more of that cushion. To test his theory, JJ has constructed a mock-up to simulate the floors underneath the squall. He'll demonstrate by using this fragile structure to break his fall from a height of three meters. What you guys should see is me coming off about eight feet above it and landing flat on my back on top of these pieces of plywood and riding the whole thing down and being able to get up and walk away without any injuries. The styrofoam beads will represent the outrush of air from the collapsing tower. J.J. walks away. He's convinced the same principle saved Pasquale Buscelli on 9-11. Well, it worked. He slowed down enough that he was within a manageable range of G-forces to allow him to survive. Pasquale Buscelli survived an unimaginable horror with barely a scratch. Was he saved by a primitive instinct? Or did he literally float down on a cushion of air? Weird. What? A man is cut in half in a freak train accident and survives. I just started kind of screaming, oh God, oh God. You know, the human body is a, is a wonderful thing. It can endure all kinds of punishment. You can shoot it. You can stab it with a knife. You can uh, hit it with um, a baseball bat. See, tough, huh? Well, OK, we're not all like that. Supermen don't really exist, right? June 26, 2006, Truman Duncan is working as a railway switchman in Cleburne, Texas. His job is to help connect the massive cars. It's very dangerous work. As you can see, the cars are very big. When you're working with heavy equipment like this, your life's on the line. Truman's connected thousands of cars in his 10-year career. But today, his routine is about to be shattered. So I was riding on the car, and we was moving down the track to make connection with some other cars. I'm standing up there, uh, end up falling off the car. Remarkably, Truman lands on his feet, uninjured. But he now faces his worst nightmare. A 20-ton rail car is rolling towards him. And there's no way to stop it. I barely had enough time to get like halfway up in a stance. And the uh, knuckle, and that's what connects the two cars together, uh, hit me in the chest. And at that time, I um, grabbed hold of it. And um, uh, of course, it was dragging me down the track, obviously. And uh, so I turned around and looked to see how, many, how much room I had, how much distance was between me and the car. I started running backwards, you know, fast as I could. And I jumped. Of course, I didn't make it. 
Truman is dragged under the oncoming wheel. It rolls over him just below the waist and then pulls his lower body up into the brake mechanism. It hit me up high, you know, it hurt. Uh, uh, caused me to kind of raise up, and that's when I grabbed on and held on. Struck with overwhelming force, Truman's lower body has been partially severed. And finally, we hit the cars. I just started kind of just screaming, you know, oh, God, oh, God. A little bit of panic. And then when that kind of stopped, I started trying to figure out what was going on. It's a scene worse than any horror movie. Truman has been dragged over 22 meters and is trapped under the train. His lower body is grotesquely twisted up in the brakes. Despite impossible pain, Truman somehow manages to regain his senses. I was laying there, and uh, it hit me that I might still have my cell phone. Truman dials 911. The operator can't believe what she's hearing. I got land over by the rail doors. I need 911. It's like I'm dead and dirty. OK. I need, I need, I need hurry up now. And someone got ran over by a rail car? She was me. And I'm about to pass out. The operator immediately dispatches help. Almost unconscious with pain, Truman somehow finds the energy to make one more call to his family. I definitely had my kids to draw on. I'd say it was a big part of me making it through. It's now 10 minutes since Truman was hit by the train. His body is in pieces. He fears that if he passes out, he'll die. But somehow he discovers a way to stay awake. There was like a little loophole right above me. So I would reach up and grab a hold of it. And I'd pull myself up. And I'd scream and top my lungs. But his agony is far from over. With injuries that would kill most human beings, Truman Duncan defies medical logic and survives another 45 minutes until paramedics arrive. First words out of my mouth when paramedics arrived was morphine. I wanted something, you know, to stop the pain. Even for the paramedics, it's a scene that defies belief. Not only is Truman alive, he's conscious and talkative. The race is now on to save his life. Truman is airlifted to a hospital. Waiting for him is emergency specialist, Dr. David Smith. They said, well, we've got a guy that's been run over by a train. And my first thoughts were, well, I'll be going down to declare somebody dead. But Truman Duncan is still alive, just. He's lost more than 50% of his blood and has injuries that shock even a veteran like Dr. Smith. He was crushed in half. In all the years I've been tra doing trauma, I've never seen anybody this torn up that I thought could survive. Truman's pelvis is obliterated. His left leg is hanging by a strip of skin, and his right leg is gone. And in one place on his abdominal wall, there is one cell layer between the outside world and his intra-abdominal contents, if you will. Some people would say his guts. Had he torn his intra-abdominal viscera, his guts, um, that would have been really bad. That would have been a whole different equation um, because then you start dealing with contamination uh, that leads to bad infections. He had plenty of contamination by the time we got done operating on him. The first time, I thought I'd picked out the contents of a gravel yard and a wood yard, as well as a pasture because there was so much grass, gravel, and wood embedded throughout his entire wounded area, which uh, is, was huge. Um, and the fact that his chest had also not been injured gave him a much better prognosis because he would be able to breathe and we would be able to feed him uh, through his own GI tract. Truman is given emergency surgery. No one is sure if he'll survive it. At the first operation, removed all the mutilated tissue, including all of the bone and tissue attached to it. So this and this should look exactly alike. So we removed this much bone from this side. A human pelvis is an exceptionally strong structure. I could take your pelvis, put it up on the floor, jump up and down on it, and not break it. That's how incredibly strong the pelvis is. To do this much damage to a person and have them live is incredible. It's extraordinary. During the next six weeks, he undergoes 22 more operations. Truman's doctors describe his recovery as nothing short of miraculous. 
most of the time, somebody with this injury would never make it to be seen by a physician. He would be dead in the field. By all means, I should have been dead, you know. Um, but uh, everything happened just right, you know. I survived. Ooh. Oh, uh, I love my trains. I have pileups all the time. Lucky for me, no one gets hurt. It's all pretend, right? Yeah, but here's this guy. He gets dragged along under a 20-ton railway carriage. Is literally cut in two, loses half his blood, and still manages to call 911 and his family for a chat. What kind of a person could do that? Dr. David Smith has an idea that's heavy duty. Truman's life was saved by the very thing which nearly killed him, the train. When a person suffers major bodily trauma, the biggest threat to life is often through blood loss. Truman had lost probably at least 50% of his blood volume. That's a fatal bleed. Why didn't Truman bleed to death? Dr. Smith is certain it's one thing, the massive force of the train's wheels. He was literally pulled up into the mechanism, which applied a great deal of pressure. The train was like five first responders applying direct pressure to a bleeding wound. Without this improvised tourniquet, Dr. Smith believes Truman would have died. Had he been thrown free, I'm quite certain that he would have bled to death there very quickly. Was Truman Duncan's life saved by the train that cut him in half? Or is there another explanation? If you let the blood pressure drop too low, you kill your patient. Amanda's cut in two in a freak rail accident. His miraculous survival defies medical science. Did the train act as a giant tourniquet and enable him to cheat death? Dr. Peter Obermark teaches in the paramedic training program at the University of Cincinnati. When I read the story of Truman Duncan's survival, the first thing that I did was, was take the story and circulated around to my paramedic friends and, and colleagues because everyone was just simply astonished that uh, it was possible for a human being to suffer that kind of, of traumatic injury and to lose that much blood and not only survive, but to really survive as a viable, intact human being. And that to me is the most incredible part of the story. Um, the, the human capacity for uh, survival under the most appalling of circumstances. He claims Truman's life was saved because of what the paramedics didn't do, which was to replace the blood he lost with IV fluids. If those paramedics had tried to treat him with the conventional resuscitation strategy of pumping him full of fluids to try to reestablish normal blood pressure, uh, he might not be alive. The reason is that too much fluid can disrupt the body's clotting mechanism, which acts to stop bleeding. It can blow a clot out of a wound or even prevent one from forming. Not only did it not uh, help control the bleeding, but it actually made the bleeding worse. Truman Duncan was treated with a newer approach. It's called permissive hypotension. It involves paramedics allowing the patient to have low blood pressure until they can be operated on. The goal is to keep the blood pressure just high enough so that the brain and the heart and the lungs are getting adequate supplies of, of oxygen-bearing blood, but not so high that you uh, increase the risk of blowing out a clot. It's not an easy treatment to perform. It really involves constantly monitoring the patient's uh, mental status, his vital signs. Essentially, if you let the blood pressure drop too low, you kill your patient. But the technique seems to improve the odds of survival. There is still a lot of debates amongst doctors who work in emergency medicine about um, when and how to apply the concept. So was Truman's life saved by permissive hypotension? Adventurer and surgeon Dr. Kenneth Kamler says Truman's survival has nothing to do with medicine. There are patients I've seen, people I've taken care of on the mountain or in the jungle who literally should have died and didn't. And there's really no medical way to explain it. 
Dr. Kamler is convinced some people can survive severe physical trauma just by thinking. Scientists call it the will to live. This is a subtle survival tool that's, that's within us, but is only brought out in extreme situations. Most of us will go through our entire lives and never know if we have that or not because we never put to the test. Dr. Kamler also thinks this unique survival tool is heavily motivated by a dedication to a higher cause. I've seen one factor which is common to all the people who do survive, and that is that they're aware of a goal larger than themselves, such as religious belief, duty to country, a feeling that they need to stay alive for their family. And I think in, in Truman's case, that's what kept him going. Did Truman survive by will alone? Dr. Camber claims the will to live not only exists, but it's a biological mechanism of the brain, located in the anterior cingulate gyrus. When charged with electricity, the mechanism shows up as red on a CAT scan. As electricity travels outward, Kamler believes it enables the brain to mobilize resources for survival. He's thinking, what do I have to do to survive? And this is how he's able to call 911 and save himself. He's actually thinking clearly at this point because the energy generated from this area in the cingulate has been brought forward. This is motivation. This is motivation to survive. And you can see it up in here. It's pretty dull back in here. His heart and lungs are failing. He needs to power these to stay alive. And in fact, the brain prioritizes itself as well. It's giving him his ability to think until he can get rescued. And he did this for 45 minutes, and he got rescued. For Dr. Kamler, it's a remarkable demonstration of the power of the mind. But do we all have it? Sadly, no. Some of us have it, and some of us don't. And that's what makes the difference between survival or, or dying. Did Truman Duncan save himself by sheer force of will? Does he owe his life to a controversial first aid technique? Or did the giant wheels of the train act as a tourniquet of steel? Weird, or what? A safari guide in Zimbabwe is savagely attacked by one of the most dangerous animals on the planet. And I just saw the monster charging in towards me. You know, I've spent a lot of time in Africa stalking the big game. And, uh, boy, it's not for the faint-hearted. Oh, no, 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 no. You need nerves of steel, and you have to know your beast like you know yourself, what he's thinking, what he's feeling. Make one mistake. And it could be your last. You only get one shot. There he is. Mm, right. mm, yeah! That was intense. These things bug me. March 9th, 1996. A group of tourists make their way down the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe. Safari guide Paul Templer is leading them with his friend Evans Namazango. I mean, the scenery there was just beautiful. Um, we were drifting down this little narrow jungle line channel, and then just ahead of us, the mist was rising up above Victoria Falls. Passing a bend in the river, they come upon a pod of hippos. They were just sitting there sunning themselves, wallowing in the shallows. And so I, I started telling them a little bit about hippos. I didn't mention to them the fact that every year in Africa, hippos kill more people than any other animal. Paul knows from experience to stay well clear of these massive creatures. The reason I would be particularly wary about a hippopotamus would be that not only do they grow quite large, 15 feet long, about five feet tall, and weigh a few tons, a fully grown bull, Hippo, uh, they're very strong. So if they bite you, typically you don't fare so well. When you see a pod of hippo, over the years I'd learned to read the water and I knew that if I stuck to shallow water, I'd be pretty safe, give them a wide berth. But just when he thinks they're clear, 
Paul hears a disturbance behind him. I turn just in, just in time to see Nu flying up and Evans, the paddler, being catapulted out of the canoe. Something is attacked and capsized the other canoe. Ignoring his own safety, Paul decides to help his friend. I leant over to grab a hold of his outstretched hand. But the real horror is about to begin. As our fingers almost touched, the water between us just erupted. Paul and Evans are under attack by a rogue bull hippo. I just saw the monster charging in towards me. His mouth was wide open as he zeroed in before scoring a direct hit. His huge tusks tearing into my torso as he drove me underwater. I punched and scratched and nothing I did had any effect. I remember at one point the hippo pulled me up into the air and I did this crazy sort of half twist before falling back into his mouth. Once I realized that I was up to my waist on the hippo's throat. <laughs> there was uh, a deep sense of, oh, crikey. Sensing Paul is weakening, the hippo prepares to finish the kill by drowning its prey. I remember lying on the bottom of the river and I was looking up. There I was pinned inside this hippo's mouth with his tusks pouring through me and, and just wondering which would happen first, if I'd bleed to death or if I'd drown. It's neither. Inexplicable. The killer hippo lets Paul go. He floats to the surface, where one of the guides is there to rescue him. I just lay there, terror and panic threatening to overwhelm me, and, and pain just coursing through my body by this stage. But then he remembers his colleague. I looked around, and there was no Evans. Mac, where's Evans? It's gone, mate. It's gone. Evans is dead. And without medical help, Paul will soon be as well. But by sheer luck, a medical team is conducting a drill on the riverbank. I made the mistake of taking a look at myself. Ugh, it's a mess. I've been skewered like a kebab. I had tusks through me all over the place. Everything went calm. I, I, I went totally calm, and the pain, it, it all went away. I, I can describe the, the physical and the emotional and the psychological aspects of it, but to me it was so much more than that. To me it was a profoundly spiritual experience, one in which I was infused with the most incredible sense of peace. And with that peace came the realization that this was my moment of choice. Um, should I go or should I stay? Should I? close my eyes and drift off, or should I fight my way through this and stick around? <laughs> the choice I made brought with it more pain than I ever imagined I could endure. But Paul now faces a new problem. He has to survive a six hour, 400 kilometer drive on rough roads to hospital. After an agonizing journey, Paul finally arrives. He's alive but the medical staff aren't sure they can save him. I heard things like, ugh, his arms are barely still attached. That foot looks horrible. He's definitely gonna lose a limb or two. Paul undergoes a seven hour operation to amputate his left arm and patch up the rest of his mangled body. I'm told that there were 38 bite marks on me. My one foot had been crushed. A hippo tried to put its tusk through it. I ended up with a punctured lung and uh, some broken ribs to go with that. I had bites on my face and um, on my spine, and there was an injury that probably came the closest to killing me. Paul's injuries should have killed him. The extensive surgery is only the beginning of a seemingly impossible recovery. I jokingly refer to this incident as my bad day at the office, and it profoundly changed my life in a number of ways. I have a far deeper sense of gratitude and appreciation for, for the day today. Paul Templer should be dead. In an epic underwater struggle, he fought off a merciless predator that savaged and gored him. How? Major General Ivan Fenton, a retired officer in the Canadian Army, thinks he knows. 
I think the fact that Paul was in the military before he had this horrific attack helped him both physically and psychologically. Paul Templer served as a gunner in the British Army in the late 1980s. General Fenton thinks this helped him stay calm. Militaries are often thought of in just military macho toughness. It's psychological, almost spiritual toughness as well. The will, the determination to overcome something terrible, to work through fear, to control yourself so that you will still do your job even though you're terrified. Paul not only stayed cool, he fought back. The military training helps you work through a mental process even when you're under huge stress. For example, uh, troops, say a section of people, nine soldiers, come under attack unexpectedly, an ambush. So they have to, under the guidance, either instinctive guidance as a team or the guidance of the leader, the section leader, where is the fire coming from? How do I get my people out of uh, the range of the bullets right away, like find low ground? And then how do I suppress the fire and how do I either get beyond it, because we have got to get, our number one mission is to get beyond it, or how do we go and take out the source of that fire? Paul knows a bit about hippos from his background. As in the military, we're always trying to train people not only to let them know what they might expect, but we're trying to make them be ready to handle the unexpected as well. And so he was able to think of, is there a vulnerable point in this thing? Yes, the snout. Can I find the snout? Yes, start punching it at the snout. Fenton also claims there was another critical factor, Paul's compassion, learned by looking out for his fellow soldiers. When you're able to focus even a small part of your consciousness on the well-being of somebody else, it helps you avoid being overcome by what's happened to you. So he wasn't thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. He, he was, where's Evans? That's, are my customers all right? Did Paul Templer's military training save him from the vicious attack of a 3,000 kilogram hippo? Those injuries were survivable from the start. A man lives through a near fatal attack by a three ton hippo. Did his military background help him survive? ER doctor Chris Martin doesn't think so. The reason Paul Templer's here today is because his injuries were survivable. A hippo's jaw can exert a force of over 1,800 pounds per square foot, twice that of a lion and seven times that of a human. Its two lower tusks are 50 centimeters long and razor sharp. They inflicted terrible damage on Paul's body. He was a mess. Uh, his scalp was lacerated, his arm was degloved. So you can imagine seeing an arm without any skin on it. He had a hole in his chest. You can actually see his lung through his chest. What Paul uh, uh, suffered uh, in the field was a sucking or open pneumothorax. And the sucking comes from the fact that when you take a deep breath, you hear the sucking noise as air gets sucked through a bloody wound in and out of the chest. Because the chest wall is only this thick, and your trachea, or the uh, tube that connects your mouth to your lungs is this thick, or this long, that air will preferentially go in and out of this hole as opposed to going in and out of your lungs. Uh, so with each breath, air gets sucked in the bloody wound and out, and it bubbles. And so the, the sucking noise is why it's called a sucking chest wound. Wounds like this would normally be fatal. Why didn't they kill Paul Templer? When people survive what should be unsurvivable injuries, I believe most of it comes down to luck. Uh, had that injury uh, hit his major vessels, his heart, had damaged the lung further, uh, he would have died. Why were Paul's vital organs intact? Incredibly, Dr. Martin thinks it's due to a unique feature in hippo design, the shape of its massive tusks. So instead of the tusk going directly in and hitting a large vessel, lacerating the lung severely, or even hitting the heart, it curved up into his chest and limited the amount of damage underneath. Paul also had another potentially fatal wound, a severed artery under his arm. But Martin claims this too was survivable because of the way the tusk penetrated his body. Had it not been so cleanly cut that it stopped bleeding basically immediately, he would have bled to death in the Zambezi River. Did Paul Templer survive because his wounds were inflicted by tusks that acted like a surgeon's scalpel? This is incredible. I, I, I mean, it's awful about poor Paul's injuries and everything. He survived, right? And the big news here is we may have a new breakthrough in medical science. Hippo tusks could revolutionize the way we do surgery. Just imagine the savings on hardware, so let's try it. Here we have a body, well, it's a watermelon, representing a human body anyway. And if it's true, this tusk should be able to perform accurate clinical surgical cuts far better than any scalp. Okay, maybe, maybe that's the blunt one. Uh, we'll, we'll, 
we'll try this. Oh dear. Uh, no, let's let's uh, let's go again. Ow. I guess there's some teething problems, maybe. Paul Templer survived what should have been fatal wounds from the head. But how did he manage to avoid drowning? Paul instinctively would have known to hold his breath when he was underwater. Western Ontario head swim coach Paul Mitchley might have the answer. He points to an experience in Templer's past that made him able to survive a near drowning experience. Paul Templer had been an aquatic athlete. Mitchley thinks this gave him an immense advantage. Some are spend 20 plus hours a week in the water. You're going to be very comfortable in the water. Paul was obviously able to keep calm and controlled uh, through his ordeal. I think I first swam competitively when I was about five and did so all the way through my teens. And I both enjoyed it and um, I also played water polo competitively. Um, I love to be in the water, on the water, underwater, anything to do with, with the water. Midgley thinks aquatic training gave Templer a critical skill the ability to time his breathing. Paul instinctively would have known to hold his breath when he was underwater and to take advantage of those brief moments above water to fill his lungs for the next submersion. But Paul was underwater for almost four minutes. How could he hold his breath so long? Paul's competitive background would allow him to utilize less oxygen while fighting the hippo than a normal, untrained swimmer. Did aquatic training give Paul Templer the edge he needed to survive the hippo attack? To check his theory, Coach Mitchley has set up a test. An Olympic swimmer will compete against an untrained control subject to complete as many underwater laps as they can. The test we're going to do is going to be a controlled test, an example of the type of hypoxic training we do uh, for competitive swimmers. We're going to do some widths of the pool underwater kick. We'll allow the swimmers to take a breath when they reach the other side. The goal? to see how much aquatic sports training can increase the ability to stay underwater. Ready, go! The Olympic swimmer pulls ahead almost immediately. Just see how efficient Joe is in the water. The control subject is already running into difficulty. It's really feeling it already, just after one whip. The control subject falls further and further behind until he finally gives up. I thought I could do it, but my lungs were giving out. Joe is still going strong. He could pretty much do these all day. The result is clear. The Olympic swimmer has a huge advantage in staying underwater. Definitely proves our point. As you can see, competitive swimmer would handle the hypoxic aspect and definitely a lot more comfortable in the water than the non-swimmer. So is Paul's background as an aquatic athlete the key to his survival on that March afternoon? Did it give him lungs of iron that even a hippo couldn't kill? We may never know. Weird. Or what? So there we have it. Amazing stories of survival from around the world. Pasquale Buscelli survives the collapse of the North Tower with barely a scratch. Was it pure luck or a weird quirk of design? A man survives being cut in two by a train. Can a strong will to live overcome horrific injuries? And a safari guide survives a vicious mauling by a hippo. Was his body made invincible by his past? Can we cheat death? Is there more to miraculous survival than simply luck? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?